it is so wonderful to see so many people in person um, and to see so many people as well. So thank you all for coming to the event today. I'm really excited um, about the lineup we have, and I thought I would kick off with a presentation about shaping tomorrow together. We've all been as a community on a journey with mental health and well-being in the workplace, a journey of how we should be thinking about this, and we've made some incredible progress. But I wanted to reflect on, well, what's next? Where do we go with this? I'm going to break the presenta presentation down into three sections. There's going to be preparation. That's going to be largely speaking focused on where are we today? What is the progress we've made? What does the data show us? And what does the wider environment that we're in mean for mental health? I'm then going to speak about what are the priorities? What should we be really focusing on and thinking about? And finally, I'm going to go back to proof, which is science, which I know all of us understand and believe as being absolutely critical in the work that we do. Now, the preparation section, I just want to forewarn you, is a fair amount of doom and gloom. It's not the prettiest section of, the, uh, of the, the, what I'm going to talk about today, but it's so important that we speak about it. We know that the number of employees at risk of burnout between 2019 and 2022 has increased by 29%. That is a very meaningful difference over a very short space of time and speaks to the place that our employees are in at the moment. We know, and we've talked about these type of figures for a long time, but it's important to keep going back to them. The economic impact of poor mental health on productivity and on the economy is estimated to be $1 trillion. It's a number that's so big, I can't relate to it at all, really. It's just huge, the economic impact the lost pro of lost productivity on, uh, because of mental ill health. And this one, I think, is particularly interesting for everybody in the room here today. Employers rate workplace mental health and well-being 22% more favorably than employees. That means that the organizations feel that fundamentally they're doing a better job than the employees feel they are doing. And that is a really important piece for all of us to bear in mind. So let's zoom out and think about the wider macro picture. We have climate change. Not a week seemingly goes past now when there isn't a news story about somewhere in the world being affected by climate activities which are unprecedented that have meaningful lives on the, on the people living in those environments. We know the cost of living crisis is a crisis of such enormous proportions that we're scrambling to know how to respond to it in a not dissimilar way to how we felt when COVID first hit. We know that there is social unrest, social injustices which have laid dormant or been unchallenged for too long are being spoken about and challenged. We know that COVID is still with us. We've been through a health pandemic that none of us could have ever imagined outside of a Hollywood film. But it's really recent. We know that from a geopolitical stance, we're kind of living in a world that maybe we read about people being scared of in the 1960s. Nuclear war is spoken about in the news every single day. We know that we are entering, if not already, in a global recession. That's a pretty scary picture. And when you put it up on one slide, I almost felt like I was maybe hamming it up too much, but I'm not. There is nothing there that is not real. That is the world we live in today. And why that's relevant to the topic of mental health is that mental ill health and mental health of human beings is not distinct of the world they live in. What goes on around us impacts on us. It's the so they are the social determinants of our health. And if you look back to the first year of COVID, there was a paper published in The Lancet, one of the most prestigious journals in the world, showing that there was an increased prevalence in the first year of COVID of anxiety and depression by 25%. That is a massive, massive increase. And you might say, well, Nick, that's been and gone. So why are you talking about the past? And the reason is this. The president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists is a man named Dr. Adrian James. 
He said, the cost of living crisis poses a threat of pandemic proportions to the nation's mental health. In other words, what we saw in COVID is being forecast to happen again as a result of the cost of living crisis in mental health of our employees. So therefore, it's, it's not surprising and it's a relief that 96% of firms plan to maintain or increase mental health investment post-pandemic. If anyone in this room knows who the 4% are that are not in that club, please can we call them out because that is a big problem. That's really great to be able to say that, 96%. That is a really important statistic, but I think it mustn't hide a very real truth. There is a man called Thomas Insull who is one of the world's most preeminent psychiatrists. He worked very closely with both the Bush and Obama administrations. He's the mental health staff of California. He's one of the great innovators in the space of mental health. And in his wonderful book called Healing, which I recommend reading for anyone interested, he said, nothing about healing our mental health crisis will be simple. And I think that is so important for us all to remember in the workplace. Nothing about healing our mental health crisis will be simple. That applies to each of our organizations. It applies to everything we do in our strategies. Now, that was the negative bit. There are some positives. For uh, raise your hand if you can remember when we were talking about, wouldn't it be great if CEOs spoke about mental health? Okay. Probably five years ago, I remember speaking with people and saying, it's a real challenge. People are not talking about this enough. That's changed. We now regularly have th thought leaders in CEOs talking about mental health. The Starbucks CEO publicly stated that the mental health of its workers is the biggest challenge coming out of the pandemic. I believe that we have some members of Starbucks team with us today, so please do share how you got your CEO to speak in that way to, to anyone interested. It's really fabulous to have CEOs highlight this as such a critical area of focus. But it's not just CEOs. We've also seen governing bodies release standards which are so helpful in providing a framework for us to address the lack of parity between physical and mental health. The ISO standards are truly valuable and the mental health standards can help all of us to further the work that we are doing. But again, it doesn't stop there. The World Health Organization is publishing guidelines specifically on mental health at work. So we've got CEOs of global organizations We've got governing bodies releasing standards. We've got the World Health Organization. And in case that isn't enough, we also have the most powerful person on earth speaking about mental health as part of State of the Union address. President Biden spoke about how we cannot transform mental health solely through the healthcare system. We must foster a culture and environment that broadly promotes mental wellness and recovery. I think not only is it incredible to have a president talk about mental health on that stage, but for a president to be speaking about how the culture and environment that people are in is a critical factor in the mental health of that individual is so, so valuable. And it's that focus on the environment and culture which the most progressive organizations are understanding is critical to bringing about the cultural change that really drives the change we're looking for in mental health. So that is the next generation of mentally healthy organizations. And what does that actually mean? How should we think about that from a scientific perspective? Well, that brings us on to the proof. What is the proof that this is the right way to be thinking? What I'm going to do is I'm going to, there are so many psychological theories and models that we could draw on, but I'm going to draw on four that I think are particularly pertinent for all of us to think about in our mental health and wellness strategies. The first, start, uh, first are orientated around the whole person. Many of you will not only embrace this model, but will have heard me talk about it before. The bio-psycho-social model. In other words, our mental health 
is not just what's going on in our brain, it's everything about our life. It's our biological life, our psychological life, our social life. Ruby Wax once described it as being not mental or physical, but a onesie, which I've always loved as a description of the biopsychosocial model. We've spoken a lot at Unmind about um, how all of these things can move in our lives and can then place us on a spectrum at any given time that we move around. I want to take that a step further today and introduce the dual continuum of mental health. Many of the world's leading organizations are focusing on the dual continuum model to understand how to think about mental illness and mental health for people. And what it speaks to is two spectrums. You have mental illness to no mental illness, and then you have low positive mental health to high positive mental health. And this gives you four quadrants. It gives you people who are struggling. It gives you this critical group who have symptoms but are content. The, the reason this is critical is often I think when people think of someone as having a mental illness, they think about them being disconnected from the world, but it's not actually true. For example, I studied postgrad psychology with somebody who had a loving family, who had, um, a, was engaged in postgrad psychology study, and also had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. It's important we recognize it's more nuanced than we're sometimes painted as. This group is also critical to think about. This is people that don't have a mental illness, but have low positive uh, mental health. And, and this is the group that were made famous by the term languishing during the pandemic. This is the languishing group that is so critical to focus on. But ultimately, where we all want to be and where we all want our employees to be is in this final bucket, to not have mental illness and to have high positive well-being. That group is flourishing, and that's where we should be driving towards. But if you look at population studies, it's not equal across those four quadrants. What we know is that the people with the mildest symptoms represent the largest, largest group. The people with the most complex symptoms or illnesses represent the smallest group. What we also know is that smallest group is the most difficult to treat. They are the most difficult to take on a journey of recovery. And why is that relevant? Well, it speaks to the fact that the earlier we can get to something, the better. So as soon as symptoms appear, we should be doing things about it. But we should also be keeping people well. And prevention is both keeping people well and providing tools to people who have mild symptoms to stop them getting into a position where that gets worse and worse. This is the step care model. If anyone's interested, Lord Layard created this model to design the whole of the way the NHS psychological interventions worked. It's subsequently been replicated around the world as the way to design healthcare services around mental health. Prevention is better than cure with this model. It's spoken about by Lord Layard in his work. It's spoken about in all health bodies. It is the way to think about it. So I've spoken about the whole person. What about the whole organization? Well, we all know that we want to provide tools to our people <coughs> to support themselves. But it's critical with organizations that we also take people from thinking about the I to thinking about the we to thinking about the all. We need our people in our teams to support others as well. And that is true across every single level of an organization. And organizations are hierarchical. We have our executives and we all know the power of having an executive who's truly bought in to the work that we're doing. We can empower them with data with insights and learning. But critically, we need to focus on the manager level. This is a group of people who set the tone, the culture of the organization around mental health, empowering them to understand better what is mental health? How can they be thinking about their employees' mental health? How can they be having the right conversations? How can they be creating psychological safety? Such an exciting opportunity and the managers. And of course, the champions, these are the fans of mental health. These people can be the, the, the real drivers of change. And there's so many opportunities to embrace this group to drive the cultural change that we're looking for. And finally, we must remember all employees as well require the tools to look after their own whole person mental health. This is what we mean by cultural change, thinking every single layer of the organization, how can we ta be talking and driving and thinking about mental health to bring about cultural change, to create environments where our people can flourish. Ultimately, 
If you take a seed and you put that seed in the wrong soil with the wrong water and the wrong light, you cannot expect that seed to grow. It is not different with our employees. If you put them in an environment which fosters the right support, that provides the right safety, the right education and learning, then you are much more likely for them to flourish like a flourishing plant would be if it were in the right soil and right water and right light. It wouldn't be an online presentation if I didn't say this. If you can't, m you can't manage what you can't measure, and that is critical both for the whole person and whole organization approach. Everything we do at our mind is, is based on this. Measure, understand, act. Measure, understand, act. And what is acting here? What does that mean? What does understanding really mean? Well, it's learning. The days of individual interventions for people with problems being represented by lying on a chaise lounge, free associating to Freud, are the days of the past. Cognitive behavioral therapy is essentially understanding based on measurement and then learning and then acting. C third wave cognitive behavioral therapy is the same thing. Third wave CBT is mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, etc. These models together can act as a blueprint for how we approach our strategies in mental health in our organizations. So the next generation of mentally healthy, healthy organization understands that this is not simple. That well-being is a strategic priority. That the whole person and whole organization approach is key to success. That well-being is continually measured and managed. And finally, that prevention is better than cure. I'm now going to hand over to Steve to take us into the next stage of today's event.